Good afternoon and welcome to this NASPO presented webinar, Solicitations of the Future, Agile and Results Driven. We are going to get started here in just a few minutes, so hang tight with us and we'll get started straight at three o'clock. Before we get started, I'm going to do a little shameless plug for our NASPO blog and podcast, Procurement Pulse. If you have not registered as a subscriber to it, you are, you are not going to want to miss it. So I dropped the link to the blog in the chat. You can subscribe to the podcast, NASPO Procurement Pulse, on your favorite podcast subscriber. We're on Apple, Google, Buzzsprout, you name it, and we're on it. So subscribe. You're not going to want to miss it. All right, since it's the top of the hour, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Solicitations of the Future, Agile and Results Driven. Thank you for spending some time with us today. We're so glad that you're here. You're not gonna wanna miss our next upcoming webinar with, uh, at NASPO on October 5th. You can join us for a discussion on the benefits of using challenge-based procurement model in the webinar, challenge-based procurement. Is it right for you? To register for that webinar, visit naspo.org. We look forward to seeing you there. At the close of today's presentation, you will be asked to complete a very brief questionnaire. Your feedback is very valuable to, to us here at NASPO. Today's presentation is good for one contact hour. To get your certificate for your contact hour, simply complete the questionnaire following the presentation today. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to explain the format of the webinar. All attendees are muted. You can enter comments and questions in the chat box. If you would like to ask a, or if you would like to ask one of our presenters a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. For our presenters today, we have Mr. Greg Wass. Greg is the senior advisor with the Harvard Kennedy School Government Performance Lab, overseeing state procurement projects within the Procurement and Economic Mobility Team. Greg was formerly senior advisor and chief information officer in the Office of the Governor, State of Illinois, and has served in the executive, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, and has served in executive positions in Cook County. Illinois, the city of Chicago, and the city of Alexandria, Virginia. We also have Colin Earhart. Colin is the project leader at the Harvard Kennedy School Government Performance Lab, working with the state of Connecticut on using con contracting and procurement to improve outcomes for state residents. He previously, ported, he previously supported the city of Chicago in lowering barriers for new and more diverse vendors to do business with the city. We also have Ms. Ar Arlene watson Pollen. Ar Arlene is a contract specialist in Connecticut's Department of Administrative Services, Procurement Services, where she manages the medical, dental, phar pharmaceutical, and host of other contracts in DAS. She is part of the Emergency Support Function 7, or ES7, and responsible for supporting the logistics and resource support during the COVID-19 pandemic response. 
Our Arlene also serves as the state point of contract for, for the Minnesota Multi-State Contracting Alliance for Pharmacies, also known as NCAP Infuse. And we also, and bringing us up to a close with our panel is Ms. Lynn Pet Petcherillo Hills. Lynn is a contract specialist as Connecticut's Department of Administrative Services Pro procurement, serving as the state, um, serving the state in a variety of roles for over 30 years. Lynn currently manages the commodities relating to food service, temporary employment services, and employee assistance program and statewide DEI services. Lynn is also a key member of the DAS Procurement Standard Operating Procedures Team that aims to ensure a more standard approach across the department. NASPO is so grateful to have all of our wonderful panelists with us today. And now I'm going to turn it over to Greg to get us started. Greg? Hey everyone, and thanks Lori for that introduction. We're very pleased to be here today to share the work that we've done as a team at the Connecticut Department of Administrative Services. If you go to the next slide, we'll take a look at the agenda for today's presentation. We really wanna know what you'd most like to learn about. So I'm first going to summarize our agenda for today. And then we'd like to hear from you in the chat about your main areas of interest. So I will start us off with some background in number one on the Government Performance Lab at Harvard. And we'll define what we mean by results-driven contract. From there, in number two, we will identify some common procurement challenges and see if these align with the challenges you face in your work. Our primary focus in the webinar today will be agenda item number three, in which the State of Connecticut team will describe the modular approach they've implemented to build RFPs using an agile sprint methodology. Now, you may have heard these terms, agile and sprint, in connection with IT projects or process improvement projects. The Connecticut team will show you how they applied these concepts to drafting solicitations and evaluating vendor proposals. In number four, we will describe some of the additional tools and supports that are available to you from the GPL and hopefully leave plenty of time at the end for questions, though we also encourage you to share your thoughts and questions in the chat throughout the webinar. Next slide, please. So the first thing that um, we're asking you to do in the chat is to tell us your name your location and organization. And if you can think of one thing or even more that you're interested in learning today, if you're not ready for that yet, then think about it some more, but at least tell us who you are, um, where you work and uh, where you're located. And as you're doing that, I'll begin with a short introduction to the GPL. Next slide, please. Uh, so what is the Government Performance Lab or the GPL? We're a fairly small organization, about 50 people. We're part of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts, part of Harvard University. Our team members are located across the country. I'm based in Chicago, for example. We typically recruit fellows after graduate school for a one to two year embedded fellowship in a state or local government to support innovative projects in a number of areas. There are three GPL fellows at the state of Connecticut, including Colin as project leader, working on both macro level procurement reforms as well as micro level individual strategic procurements. The GPL has worked with 10 state governments and more than 60 local governments across the US on improving contracting in goods and services and in social services, including the subject matter areas you see on the right side of the slide. Also this fall, we are starting a national procurement innovators network and we regularly issue publications about our research and projects. Next slide, please. In our work across the country, we've identified four major areas for potential procurement improvement that together we call results-driven contracting. These strategies are aimed at helping governments use procurement and contracting to achieve better outcomes for residents. First, we're focused on transforming the procurement process to be efficient, inviting, and transparent, essentially making the process run more smoothly for both prospective vendors and staff. In this first pillar, we are often working with governments to map and streamline their procurement and contracting processes. The second pillar is procurement is often seen as a back office function, but how can we elevate the status of procurement within government to ensure that it's properly resourced and seen as a core government function that's strategic, not just administrative. Third, we are aiming to improve the outcomes of contracted programs, products, and services. 
For any service or program run by an outside entity, what can we do during the RFP process and in the management of contracts to improve the end outcome? Whether, for example, it's better maintained parks or reduced rates of unemployment from a job training program. Our fourth pillar is equity, which really means two things. First, increasing the participation of and awards to more diverse vendors in competitive procurements. And two, ensuring that performance measures are in place and contracts are managed in such a way that equal or better outcomes are realized for historically marginalized populations. In this webinar today, we're focusing on the third pillar. How can we craft better RFPs to help realize the desired outcomes of contracted programs, products, and services, whether it's a workforce development program, a new project management software, or a senior meal delivery program. Next slide, please. We want to explore the connection between RFP drafting and contract outcomes. So going from left to right in this logic model, starting on the far left, well-crafted RFPs matter because giving applicants or respondents the information they need means that the responses will be aligned with our goals. In the center, we also need an effective proposal evaluation process that advances the proposals that are most likely to deliver the results we want. And then we reinforce this with contracts that may include expectations, requirements, performance measures, and incentives. And then finally, on the far right side of the model, we introduce a practice of active contract management that views vendors or providers as your partners in delivering good results. Creating excellent RFPs, again, is the focus of our discussion today. RFPs matter because they're the first step in ensuring that procurement and contracting actually do their part to help get the results we're working to achieve with state programs. Next slide, please. But it's not as simple as it may seem. We found that governments face a variety of challenges when drafting RFPs. First up, often RFPs may be great at sharing a laundry list of what a contractor needs to do, but there are no outcomes identified. This could be because it was difficult to balance very different stakeholder perspectives when drafting the original RFP. The impact of this can often be that what vendors are providing isn't actually aligned with your goals. Second, RFPs are often fire drills. In some governments, we've seen teams rush like crazy to get an RFP released, only to realize that the RFP is missing critical information or has errors and needs to be amended or reissued. Third, we sometimes find that folks cut or limit the information gathering or market research phase before writing an RFP, or in the face of a daunting workload are tempted to simply reissue the RFP that was previously released. But the world has changed a lot in the last five to 10 years. New technologies might be available, new overlapping programs may exist at the federal or local level, and demographics may have changed or customers or clients needs have changed. And finally, the scope of work may be overly prescriptive and include onerous requirements that don't actually connect to any of your goals. This can limit the number of quality proposals you receive, result in higher prices, or stifle innovation. Your RFP is also your first hint to vendors what it will be like to work with you. Burdensome requirements might signal to vendors that the contract is more trouble than it's worth. Next slide. So let's do a poll to find out which of these challenges most resonate with you, which reminds you of a bad RFP experience that you'd probably rather forget. And you can feel free to share more in the chat. We'd love to know if there are other major challenges you face when going through a procurement process for key services or products. So we'll leave this up for a minute, but the polling question is, from where you sit, which of these common challenges occurs most frequently in your jurisdiction? Choose one of the following answers. I'm going to count on NASPO to see if we get enough responses that we're ready to show the results here. There is one revealing comment in the chat, which is all our challenges in our office. Okay, so it looks like we've got a tie between team rushes through writing the RFP to get it out the door fast, 
and limited information gathering and market research occurs or RFPs simply recycled from the last time it was issued. So that's very helpful. Uh, I think, in fact, Colin and Lynn and Arlene may be able to relate to this in Connecticut. Um, so let's hear from the Connecticut team now on how their work is structured and how they used an agile sprint methodology to tackle these common procurement challenges. So handing it over to you, Colin, to walk us through the work in Connecticut and go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Um, so it's good to see everyone this afternoon again. My name is Colin Earhart. I'm a project lead working with the state of Connecticut over the last two years and I'm really excited to co-present the remainder of the presentation with Arlene and Lynn. And we'll talk a little bit specifically about our work on the sprints in just a moment. But before jumping into that, I do wanna provide a little bit of context about our work in Connecticut to help explain how that's informed one of our high priority initiatives to build a more efficient and effective outcomes oriented RFP writing process. So you'll see on the screen that the way GPL works in Connecticut is we have embedded fellows working both statewide, helping to support the two main procurement authorities in Connecticut, the Department of Administrative Services and the Office of Policy and Management, which collectively either directly or oversee the mass majority of procurement in Connecticut, including goods, contractual services, professional services, and social service procurement. So by partnering with these entities and helping to improve processes and providing new tools and, and supports, we've really been able to, from a statewide level, impact procurement across the state. But we've also had embedded work specifically with one agency, the Office of Early Childhood, which is a newer agency that can really pilot some more transformational procurement changes and learning from those lessons to scale up. So it's been this really incredible combination of partnering with really sophisticated statewide entities, but then also with one newer organization to sort of both from a bottom up and top down approach, improve the way that procurement and contracting has worked in Connecticut. And one of the main ways that we've done that is through the right hand side of the screen, which is an early sign of what we call RFP sprint approaches. So in just a moment, Arlene, Lynn and I will talk about what that looks like in practice, but you can see that at its core, we're really talking about a series of activities to help build momentum around the RFP writing process to make it more effective and efficient. So Chabuk, if you go to the next slide, what exactly do we mean by a results-driven contracting RFP sprint? So what that is at the highest level is simply that there is a series of structured workshops that take place for an RFP writing team and then follow-up assignments that happen on a weekly basis to make sure that there's enough momentum to get that RFP out in the street in a timely fashion. So how that starts is that typically we try to bring together at least one RFP writing team. And that may start with a procurement specialist who's then identifying sort of key stakeholders across an agency on what inputs they need to populate that RFP. So they may reach out to subject matter experts, program staff, fiscal, legal, all those voices that are critical to actually make sure the RFP is properly communicating a jurisdiction or an agency need to the vendor community. So that's how it starts. We kind of build this RFP writing team. But then what's unique about the sprint is we actually try to position multiple RFP writing teams to go through the process at the same time. So we identify multiple RFPs that may be released to the street around the same time to allow those folks to cross collaborate across agencies, across staff to learn from each other through this process and ultimately have stronger um, and more cohesive RFPs across the government. So that's really that second bullet about bringing those teams together in this structured fashion. And then the third piece of the sprint itself is that we try to offer through these sprint workshops, a standardized approach to generate those building blocks. So in just a moment, I'm gonna talk about what GPL considers sort of the key pieces that every RFP should have to ensure that you're effectively communicating to the vendor community and achieving that logic model that Greg shared and then the sprint is really structured around those thematic topics to make that happen. So Chavik, if you go to the next slide. So before jumping into the logistics of how the sprint works, I did wanna just show sort of the broad range of RFPs and solicitations that Connecticut has put through this sprint process. So you can see they really run the full range from you know, slightly more simple services like custodial services, which in their own world can actually be pretty complex, to really complex social service programs, like when we have the Office of Early Childhood re-procure their home visiting program through a sprint. So it can really range from more traditional goods and services to really complex social service procurements. And really the only criteria for what makes sense to go through a sprint is could this RFP or solicitation benefit from a structured way to gather different input from different stakeholders. 
as well, is there a real need to sort of look into whether this RFP itself could benefit from more attention to more effectively communicate to the vendor community on what is needed? So that's sort of the typical candidates for the sprint is anything that meets that. The one piece that may not make sense to go through a sprint is if you're procuring for a more traditional good or service that the state has procured for on a regular basis, knows exactly what it wants, and may not actually benefit from sort of going through this more intensive process. But you can see on the screen, these are sort of the, the range of services and goods that have gone through sprints in Connecticut. And we've also kind of modified, you'll see with the asterisk, a couple of other RFPs that haven't gone through this full-blown process, but that we've taken elements of the, the sprint methodology and applied to them as well. So Chabak, if you go to the next slide. All right, so last slide before we jump into explaining the logistics of the sprint. So on the screen here are sort of the six key components that the GPL thinks really matter in, in, in terms of writing an outcomes-oriented RFP. And in a lot of ways, it's almost like a cheat sheet that at the end of an RFP writing process, we encourage governments to look back and see, are these co components clearly communicated in the RFP? And as a vendor, if I put my vendor hat on, am I able to see these pieces in, in a transparent way when they scan through the RFP? And you'll see in a moment that the sprint is really focused on capturing and building out each of these components on a weekly basis. So the first component is, is there some sort of opening statement that clearly communicates to the vendor community? What is the challenge the state is facing and what constitutes success for this contract? I think as Greg mentioned, often it can be easy to jump to really specific technical requirements or expectations for vendors without actually giving them a vision for what is the issue the state's even facing and why is the state looking to the vendor community to help them solve that? By having this like powerful, succinct opening statement, it can really help vendors more effectively craft their response and make it easier for evaluation committees to determine if they're the right fit for this service or good. So that's the first piece. The second piece is, is the state communicating who the defined target or user population is? Who ultimately does the state really want to prioritize is getting this service? Um, are there specific users that have very particular needs that the state may be able to share additional information to allow vendors to better provide in their proposal responses how they would meet those needs? So I think often the state has really rich information about target populations or users that will benefit from this good or service but they're not sharing that with the vendors. And it can be a really powerful thing to actually let vendors know about the specific understanding the state already has about these populations. So that again, vendors can better respond with their proposals and how their solution meets this need. So that's the second piece. The third piece talks about this challenge that Greg brought up, brought up which is how within the actual scope of service where you're explaining to vendors what the state needs, are you finding that balance between being too broad where there's not enough information to actually allow vendors to understand what they would be expected to do, but not being so prescriptive that you're launching essentially dozens of requirements, dozens of pages of requirements that limit the innovation that the vendors can bring with their own expertise. So as you look at that section, are you as a government finding that balance, which, which can be really hard between being too prescriptive and too broad and sort of allowing yourself to um, be clear about when there's sort of legal requirements or minimum thresholds of what must happen in terms of service expectations, but leaving some other areas open to the vendors to bring their expertise in through their proposal responses. So that's the sort of the third bucket in the RFP. The fourth bucket has to do with as early as the RFP, are you as a state communicating what are the key performance metrics that the vendors will be held accountable during the life of the contract? And along with that, are you putting in place an early contract management plan to partner with the vendor who gets awarded to ensure effective service delivery? I think often this is something that's figured out after the fact, you know, once a contract is awarded and you start project management meetings to work with the vendor, but it can be really powerful as early as the RFP release to explain how the state wants to work with the vendor and how the vendor will be held accountable through key performance metrics. So by doing that in the RFP, as Greg alluded to, you can start to communicate to vendors about what they should expect this partnership with the state will look like if they're awarded a contract. And then lastly, the fifth key component, uh, I won't talk too much about the six as it's more of an optional consideration, but the fifth piece is around the evaluation process. So I think governments are typically really good at understanding you know, criteria that they may want to evaluate vendors on, but there's a little bit of a more thoughtful process that can take place 
to match whether the actual proposal questions and proposal requirements connect back to that criteria. As governments are looking through the questions that they're making vendors submit responses to, is again, that finding a balance of providing enough information for evaluation committees to make decisions about who's best positioned to provide this good or service without going too overboard where there's so much information requested that it may actually limit competition because vendors have no interest in spending weeks or even months trying to respond to really complex proposals. So again, it's a balancing act to figure out how you achieve that balance. So these are sort of the key components. And in a second, I'll show you how this maps perfectly onto what we try to accomplish in the sprint. So Chavik, if you go to the next slide. So this is a typical sprint schedule and Arlene and Lynn will jump in in a moment to kind of talk about what this looked like for them. But essentially you'll see it maps completely onto those thematic concepts that we talked about for results driven contract. So each week there's a workshop that you were trying to build out the different components, starting with writing a problem statement and outcome goals, all the way through developing those evaluation criteria and proposal questions. So the goal with the sprints is that each week, these RFP writing teams are creating momentum around developing those concepts and working collaboratively to really effectively communicate those sections to the vendor community. So this is sort of the high level view of what's happening on a weekly basis. But then Chadwick, if you go to the next slide, what happens within the weeks of the sprint is a little bit different. So essentially there's an anchor activity that happens typically in the middle of the week so in this case, it's on a Wednesday, and that's where the actual 90 minute sprint workshop takes place, where these RFP writing teams come together and they share out on their early drafts on these different RFP sections. And then the other RFP writing teams and often observers will give feedback and will let the RFP writing teams know where may, there may be opportunities to strengthen those early drafts and more effectively communicate to vendors through those early RFP drafts. And essentially these workshops are, are serving two purposes, to allow for that collaboration and feedback, but then also to introduce the thematic topic for the following week, to help these sprint teams understand for the, the following week, the different follow-up assignments that they'll have to do to prepare for the next workshop. So you're having this collaboration space during the actual workshop on Wednesdays, and then you're also having this learning space around best practices to help inform the RFP writing team when they go out on their own to start drafting the next section to build that out effectively. And this basically repeats for all six weeks of the workshop and creates this really powerful dynamic where the team has momentum around key decisions and writing that happens over those six weeks. So Chabuk, if you go to the next slide. So the last piece before bringing in Lynn and Arlene is just to show you an example of an activity. So I know there's a lot of text on the screen here, but this is actually one activity that we, we typically do during that first kickoff workshop, which is, there's this really exciting moment when an RFP writing team comes together for the first time and you have program, fiscal, legal, subject matter experts all coming together with different perspectives and visions for what they want out of this RFP. And what we do with this getting started worksheet is we try to get all those voices together and start answer these key questions around the RFP writing process. And it's a great way for whoever sort of the captain or lead to start to see where is there already consensus and agreement across the group about these different pieces? And where are there open questions? Where we, where we might have to reach out to more senior stakeholders to make decisions or get additional information from agency experts to help fill the gaps. So it's a great way early on in the RFP writing process to figure out where there's already a lot of progress and where there's a lot of work to be done. So typically in that first workshop, we'll actually spend an hour working with each RFP writing team to start answering these questions. And what's really exciting about this tool is even for uh, folks who aren't going through a full sprint process, it can also just be a really helpful ad hoc tool to gather input and requirements from any stakeholders if you're in charge of writing an RFP to start to get their thoughts as you're trying to draft this document. All right, so I, if Chadwick, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So I've been doing a lot of talking, so I wanna make sure to bring in uh, Lynn and Arlene into the conversation. So. Lynn, I think uh, you're up first. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your experience with the with, with the sprint. So, um, just to give a little bit of context to, to folks on the call, um, Lynn was one of our fearless captains for the original RFP writing sprint, um, and you can see on the top side of the screen it describes a little bit about her team's dynamic, where she had multiple 
um, colleagues from DAS procurement who supported her, as well as agency subject matter experts from sister agencies like the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and the Department of Corrections. And they all collaboratively worked together over six weeks to produce this RFP draft related to temporary medical services. And you can see some of the background around the challenges that the group faced in sort of implementing that draft. But Lynn, I, to bring you into the conversation, I'm curious, thinking back to that original sprint, what stood out to you as, as different than your normal process for trying to write an RFP? Thanks, Colin. Um, well, my normal process for writing an RFP is, um, you know, this was a, a contract that was already existing and that has to be renewed. Um, so we do have specifications for it. And what I would normally do is kind of what a lot of others do is take those specifications and, and alter them a, a bit, um, you know, get our key stakeholders more or less it's via email, um, looking at the document. Um, but this process um, and the workshop was more of a structured format that allowed us to have that collaboration for also the end users and the key stakeholders to really understand the process and understand what we're, we're, we're seeking. And actually even for me to, to get that information out of them. So, um, and even out of me, this was definitely a structured process that made you think um, about what our goals were, what the challenges are of the existing contract. Great, Lynn, and you, and you started to allude to this a little bit, but I'm curious, I mean, part of the structure was that you were not sort of isolated. And I think often RFP writing can be a really isolating experience where you're tasked with writing an RFP and you know maybe given some specifications or details, but then told, go figure it out. But I think with the sprint, you were able to have additional support. You had other colleagues from DIS procurement who were part of your team. You had these agency subject matter experts. So I'm curious how having a full RFP writing team with both DIS procurement colleagues and these sister agencies, how did that result in a more effective RFP draft? Um, well, having the feedback of my colleagues and um, the stakeholders and the business, we had also business office involved in it, um, the key players. Um, and we all were simultaneously working on, on these RFPs. Um, and it was great to get feedback from our, our peers and, and really learn the process. Um, and my RFP has not been issued at this point, but you know what turned out was more, it was clearer, it was concise, it allowed for the proposers to offer solutions um, or alternative ser services. It wasn't as prescriptive. Um, you know, we really got to look at the meat of, of it. And I, you know, it definitely used a parts of the sprint aspects in my current solicitations that I have done. And also I will definitely use it in my future. It's just a great um, tool. That's great, Lynn. And, and to sort of the last question before bringing Arlene in, and you hinted at this as well. So at the bottom half of the screen is actually an excerpt from a recent RFP that didn't go through a full sprint process, but was sort of more of a light touch support around um, employee assistance programs. Can you talk a little bit more about how you approached that RFP writing process and what lessons you took from, from the sprint, even though you didn't go through another sprint with this sort of what lessons you, you took to help write this RFP? Um, that was definitely more of a um, lower key type of sprint. And I had the Lars helping me with that, your, your co-partner in, in this, who, who was definitely benef a benefit. Um, and we also came up with the um, stakeholder, especially there was one key stakeholder of the contract. And, and actually, I, I, it's probably more of the diversity contract that um, I had worked on too, where we, we kind of gathered information by asking those questions that were were in the sprint process and made that those stakeholders think about what the actual goal was and also allowed for solution base and, and solutions to come from proposers too. Great. Thanks, Lynn. And, and folks can kind of see this, this excerpt. And again, this comes from an RFP that Lynn recently released for employee assistance program. This is that problem statement that we spoke of, that opening statement to sort of explain to the vendor community what the state is, is seeking assistance on before jumping into specific service requirements, you know, providing that overview and allowing vendors and providers to understand, okay, this is the challenge the state is facing and here's some information to help us think 
at a high level about how to respond. And, and I think this is a, a really helpful example to see how even without going through a sprint, you can still create some of these components to, to write effective RFPs. Well, thank you, Lynn. We'll see you back in a second when we get to the Q&A. Um, but Chabuk, if you go to the next slide. Well, I'm excited to also bring uh, another one of my colleagues, Arlene, into the conversation. Um, like Lynn, Arlene was another one of our fearless captains of the original RFP writing sprint. Um, and, and her team was focused on an RFP uh, related to drug and alcohol testing. Um, and folks can actually see the full details of that sprint at, at the top of the screen to see some of her colleagues at both DAS procurement and then the fact that there was subject matter experts from the Department of Transportation that also supported this RFP. Um, and there's sort of some background also provided in, in the middle of the screen. Uh, so Arlene, I'd love to bring you into the conversation with a similar question that I asked Lynn, which is, you know, you've definitely had experience over the years writing different RFPs for DAS procurement, as well as invitation to bids, but what was unique about this sprint process and, and how you sort of approach this differently um, because you went through this structured process? Uh, good afternoon to everyone and thank you, Colin, for that question. Um, I would say what stood out to me as being different in this process was the ability to get everyone in the same room at the same time, meaning my stakeholders and establishing a good, solid relationship with them. Um, it proved throughout the entire process to be very invaluable. Um, I believe, Colin, you mentioned the homework assignments as part of the sprint. That part of the process was uh, very beneficial because what it did, it allowed everyone to be part of the team and it opened up conversation throughout the entire process. Also, um, in this process, what was different is that able to work with other um, professionals in our office, like I had uh, someone from the IT team, I had someone from supply diversity, and I had one, I had someone from another team. And it was great because everyone, it just made a really great dynamic in the team. And we we're all able to feed off of each other and share information. That's great, Arlene. Yeah, and I, and I, I remember specifically, I mean, because you were one of the sprint captains going through the RFP process with your team and, and Lynn as well, and, and another captain who I believe is on the call, Melissa, you were all able to sort of work together and offer feedback during the actual workshops as you were drafting those different homework assignments. That, that's definitely great. One, one thing I wanted to dive a little deeper, which I think was particularly impressive by your group is folks can actually see this excerpt from when the team drafted as one of their homework assignments, the evaluation criteria and thinking about what a top score would look like, sort of an additional um, dimension that would be used internally by the evaluation committee to help score the proposals that came in. And I'm curious sort of what process your team went through to help develop this criteria and ultimately think through this second piece around what a top score would look like. Oh, great question, Colin. Um, first, what we did is we had to really understand and identify the goal and keep in mind, like we're doing this during the sprint. So we had to come up with solutions in a fraction of the time. So what we did is um, we had to approach what are the current pain points in the current existing contract and what are the most important criteria we need to have addressed uh, so the proposers can provide the best solution in their response. We brainstormed by identifying the problems, again, having a clear understanding of what they are, and what we did is we wrote them down. So then we had a focus. And out of that, um, we decided, we got the ideas and we came up, we narrowed down the list to the top seven um, items, as you see, as our criteria um, for the RFP. Um, then we applied weights to the categories for the evaluation. Uh, we knew from previous discussion within the team that the testing capabilities and the report, reporting methodologies were extremely important for a successful contract. So we weighed those higher than the other categories um, in our criteria. Then we determined a top score would be the proposer whose response addressed in detail their solution to the pain points and to follow up with a virtual interview with the top score and proposer. During this interview, we probed deeper by asking the highest form proposer additional questions we had identified throughout our evaluation. We determined that testing 
apologize, we determined that training was of extreme importance to ensure timely drug and alcohol test results. For this reason, we discussed various training options with the proposer to ensure the stakeholder would have the information they needed more readily available. That's great, Arlita. And the one piece that we're not showing on the screen, which I think your team did an equally impressive job, was looking at these criteria, thinking about the top scores, and then mapping them to the actual proposal questions and submission requirements and making sure that that found the balance of asking enough information that your evaluation committee could score on those collection of materials without providing too much, uh, providing too many questions that I think would scare away some potential vendors. So I think another impressive element of your team. Um, Arlene, the last piece that I want to ask you about, and I kind of want to then bring a specific quote in from one of the agencies that participated in your in your sprint, is, you know, in future RFP writing activities, how do you think the sprint will inform your approach, even if you don't go through this same structure? Are there any lessons you'll take from this experience to, to help inform your future RFPs that you're tasked with writing in a more traditional fashion? Yes, absolutely, Colin. Um, I would say this experience and um, the experience I gained during the sprint pro process um, confirmed that moving forward, it is imperative to have the right stakeholders uh, in place as you start the process, um, making sure everyone is in the room at the time from the, from the beginning to the end. Um, for future RFPs, I definitely, like I said, I will use this process. I like the structure of a sprint. Um, I like the teamwork. I like the focus. And I like the follow through and the solutions that we all came up with um, in order to put out a better RFP for our stakeholders. Um, the process, this whole approach, you know, has allowed me to open discussions and have a better and clearer understanding of what my stakeholders need. Um, all the tools that were given to us by your group proved to be extremely beneficial. And it's definitely something I would, if I am doing another RFP in the future, I definitely will adopt those principles. That's great, Arlene. And I know you had recently reached out to one of the agency counterparts that you would work with through this sprint process. And they equally really enjoyed this process. I think it's, you know, hopefully folks are seeing how beneficial it is for procurement professionals to sort of have these increased communication channels and opportunities to collaborate. But I think it's also great for agency end users who are also getting space to sort of more effectively communicate what they want out of this. So there's less back and forth happening by email or miscommunication that's happening through more traditional, you know, information collection processes. And I know that was a specific piece that um, the Department of Transportation had shared as they went through this process was feeling really heard and, and, and coming to this process and feeling like this was a, a structure that allowed them to more effectively uh, communicate with you about what their needs were for this RFP. Yes. So thank you, Arlene and Lynn. I think, uh, Chava, could you go to the next slide? I'll just close out uh, before we start to get to the Q&A piece around some other benefits that the Connecticut folks have highlighted through the sprint process. So some of these Arlene and Lynn touched on, but you know, it, it really can be a great mechanism to improve stakeholder communication, both within agencies. So as we talked about, because you're bringing together these RFP writing teams and getting legal, fiscal, procurement, program, subject matter experts all together, it sort of breaks down those traditional silos where information is mainly coming by email or one-off phone calls and bringing all those people together in one physical or you know, post-COVID virtual space um, to, to kind of align in a more efficient way, but also across departments. So because you have multiple sprint teams, we have situations where you know, the Department of Corrections and the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, they're getting to learn from the perspectives of folks at the Department of Transportation, which may not be a voice they normally hear about, but it actually makes RFPs a lot stronger when folks who are not so uh, deep in a specific service or commodity need are getting feedback from others uh, to make sure that the communication is sort of at a level that vendors who might not be super in the weeds can effectively respond. So that's sort of the first benefit that we've definitely heard. Um, the second is really this forcing mechanism. I think folks alluded in the, the challenge poll to, to Greg that RFP running is often a really rushed activity, but even when there's this pressure to get it done as quickly as possible, it can take many months. I mean, just getting folks aligned, getting all the inputs that are needed to actually have an RFP hit the street, it can be difficult because folks are juggling different priorities and there's not always a forcing mechanism to make those key decisions. So this sprint approach you know, creates this 
uh, this, this, I wouldn't say necessarily fear, but it creates this you know, desire to make sure that you're prepared for the next workshop and makes everyone make quick decisions to, to ensure that they stay on track to complete the sprint at the end of the six week process. So it sort of creates this motivation for everyone to get this done in a much more efficient way. And then lastly, I would talk about the final bullet, which is, you know, Greg spoke to how, you know, too often I think procurement is not viewed as a strategic opportunity, which I think is, is sad. Um, you know, I think there's incredible importance in procurement being viewed as this tool to make real progress on, on outcome goals for a state. And I think what the sprint does is it actually creates this platform for more senior leaders to participate. I think in normal RFP writing processes, senior leaders at agencies may have less desire to kind of engage in the, the weeds of trying to help write an RFP. But if there's an actual structure to bring them to a workshop where there may be dozens of folks offering perspectives and feedback, they may be more inclined to come to that and offer their thoughts and provide more of a strategic vision for the group. So I think that's the last piece is that the sprint really creates this pathway uh, to allow uh, senior leaders to, 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 to participate in, in RFP writing processes. So these are kind of the, the benefits of the sprint um, and, and happy to talk more about these um, in a moment during the Q&A, but I think I'll bring Greg in to just close us out to talk about some additional opportunities for, for GPL to provide support. Thanks, Colin. Um, really great. And um, of course, I have a question for Lynn, which I'll save for the Q&A, um, something to do with homework. Um, we have additional resources for RFP support. Uh, you'll see on this slide, the guidebook for crafting a results-driven request for proposals. That is available for free. Uh, don't try to write down that link. I think NASPA will send either this slide deck or some email out after this event to all the people who attended. And you can find it on our website and feel free to download it. It'll tell you a lot of the things in more detail that you've seen today. And we are starting something very soon this fall, um, a community of procurement innovators across the country at the state level and city level and county level. So um, if you'd like to learn more about that as we're developing that those ideas, or if you've got ideas for that kind of community, please uh, give me send me an email, greg underscore was at hks.harvard.edu. So I'm excited. We have a few uh, questions already in the chat and in the Q&A. And um, I don't know, Laurie, if you want to walk us through those, and we're going to try to figure out on the fly who, who's best to respond to those. I'm going to ask my question though first of Lynn before we before go we you know, go into the into the questions that people from the audience have asked. Um, Lynn, not not to put you on the spot here, but do you prefer to assign homework or to receive homework assignments during sprints? <laughs> I prefer to assign homework. <laughs> okay, okay, that sounds great. That was definitely one thing that stood out to me too was like to have homework assignments. It's, brought me back to school days, you know, just, I felt like Colin was my teacher. <laughs> back in high and I would say one lesson learned is around branding. We've kind of tried to move away from saying homework assignments because I think folks get nervous about that and call them follow-up assignments because That's ultimately right. Right. it's work that needs to get done to get the RFP released. So it's things that folks are doing anyway, but it's sort of in a more structured and bite-sized piece. Scratch homework, follow-up assignments. Okay. Very good. Okay, so um, we are ready for your questions. Uh, Laura, how would you like to proceed? Well, I think I'll just start here from the top. It looks like our first one that came in is really kind of more directed about process. I'm gonna start with you, Colin and Greg. Can you talk to me about the difference between completing this process online versus in person? What are your challenges and the benefits from that you've seen from doing both? You wanna go first, Greg, or should I? Oh. You ran the sprints. Go ahead. <laughs> so it's a great question. And I think COVID became a very uh, helpful test case in this process. So I think the original sprints were all in, in person. So the sprints that we described with Arlene and Lynn, that was basically bringing together folks in weekly workshops where they would physically all come to the same room and allow for this collaboration. The, the sort of outside workshop activities would take place by phone or, or by, um, by, by teams. Um, but we would try to physically bring people in. But then obviously once COVID happened, the more recent sprints that we've done, especially in the health and human service space, that's been much more virtual where we've all kind of come on to workshops through Teams or Zoom. And, and I'd say that there are very real trade-offs to both. I think what's really powerful about the in-person workshops is there is something about all coming together and being face-to-face -face and kind of 
having your full attention as part of this process and, and, and coming together and offering feedback, it just makes engagement a lot easier, but there's also logistical challenges, right? So I think there's some other questions about how you bring together these different stakeholders across agencies. And often, you know, even in Connecticut, which is a slightly smaller state, it can be really difficult to get folks to be able to all come to the same place. It might be geographically challenging. So it's actually logistically sometimes easier to coordinate calendars and get all these folks to come together in a virtual space. So I think that's been one piece that we've learned, you know, post COVID is logistically, it may be a little bit easier to kind of get all these folks bought in um, in this virtual setting, but you do lose a little bit of the magic that happens in person. But Greg, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Well, just that we started in 2019. We never expected that we'd be doing these things virtually. And I think the team, a lot of credit goes to the team for figuring out how to do this sprint, which engages people from lots of different subject matter areas um, and people who've never been together before to work on a project like this um, to engage them virtually. And, and I think you all figured it out. And, um, you know, I think the future will probably hold some blend of those things. We're as a as an organization, we are conducting sprints um, across the country with multiple cities or states at a time. So there's times when it has to be virtual. So. Thank you. It looks like our next question is kind of touching on uh, something that was just kind of brought up. So Colin, Greg, uh, have you run into challenges with getting agency subject matter experts to buy in to get a high level of time investment under the structure? Is that a major hurdle getting that buy in? What does that look like? Um, I'll just start off here and then turn it to you, Colin. Um, yeah, it's true that the sprint approach does take some more time. And you probably don't want to use it for all procurements. You, you probably want to select those procurements that are strategic. They may be important uh, within your government. They may, may be a high dollar value. They may be something that haven't, hasn't been re-procured for a long time. And the marketplace has changed, as I suggested before. So if it's strategic, um, you can probably convince those subject matter experts and people from the agencies to spend more time on it because it's important to them. I think that's what um, really distinguishes the, the RFPs that uh, you should put through this kind of process from the ones that uh, maybe you can learn some things as Lynn, you mentioned you did from the sprint process to apply to like a sprint light approach with other procurements. But if it's strategic, um, think about a sprint. Yeah, I would add, and I actually would love Lynn or Arlene if they feel comfortable to jump in here. As you were sort of trying to build your RFP writing teams, did you find it was a hard ask to get, you know, Department of Corrections, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and the Department of Transportation to buy into this? Did you feel like that was a, a big ask or were they excited about this opportunity? I, I would say for my RFP, my Sprint RFP, it was not, DOT was more than happy to participate. I only had one agency, so it was easier in my, in, in, for me because I only had to deal with one agency, but they were really happy to be coming to the table and to actually start collaborating with DAS, um, because sometimes the myth is that, you know, uh, we submit these specifications to you and then that's it. In this case, we they were able to come to the weekly meetings that we scheduled and participated and, and really they appreciated the outcome. Um, and my contract um, for the temporary employment was um, is a multi-use age agency contract. Um, DOC definitely wanted to be involved um, because they use it, um, it's highly used from them and there's anticipated um, usage um, increase for it too. So I did get buy-in from them really quickly. Um, the other agencies, it was, it was difficult as with other RFPs that I've done too. It's, it's, um, definitely a challenge at times. Thank you. Uh, out, you know, Lynn and Arlene, this next question, I think kind of builds off the one that we just had, which is, you know, we just talked about getting their buy-in. Talk to me about maintaining their commitment to the process throughout it. How do, how do, how are you able to accomplish that? How are you able to keep them engaged in the process? Um, well, with the one we did for temporary medical, um, I think that it came from their higher 
ups at times. So I think that helped to keep the engagement and not even just engagement, but even approval of their time. You know, they, I had reached out to DOC, explained the time um, constraints that was going to happen, what we were going to do, how long it was going to be, um, mm -hmm. and they did get their approval. So I think that in itself um, kept them engaged, and, and, I, and the process itself kept it, them engaged, too, with Colin and, and Greg and the whole homework assignments. <laughs> I would agree with the homework assignments. They were something, they are something, um, but um, to keeping um, my DOT uh, counterpart engaged in the entire process was um, very smooth. Um, and I think because she, for so long, they finally are getting, being heard. So the engagement was there. The, the only thing that happened along the way um, she, the individual retired, but then she came back out to work for, you know, 120 days. So it just took a little break in between. And then I had to work with someone else. And that was a, just a, a small struggle because now you have to bring that other person up to speed as to what we're doing, where we are, what our goals are, you know, and that kind of stuff. And fortunately, the, the lady came back. So we have been still been working together right now. The RFP is under evaluation. And I hope to have an award by the end of September. Yeah, that's great. And, and the only other thing I'll add, Lori, um, is you know, in some more recent sprints that have been virtual, I think some of that time commitment piece has been a little simplified because it's you know not having to come to a physical space. But I think there is a little bit of a sales job that happens at the beginning of a sprint where we kind of talk to the agency counterparts and we explain that, you know, in, even in a normal RFP writing process, that's a big time commitment. I mean, agencies who care about how that RFP gets released, they're going to be spending hours providing feedback, you know, giving inputs. And with the sprint, at least it puts it into sort of a structure that makes everyone feel like they're, they're efficiently communicating and there isn't all this back and forth. So I think that's part of the sales job is explaining it's sort of it is a lot of time, but it's sort of a different amount of time than the, the normal process. Thank you, everyone. And it looks like our last question is coming from Josh, wants to talk about, are sprints designed for mostly interagency and statewide contracts for services that more than one agency can use? Could this method also be used in a large agency with many divisions? And can you kind of discuss that? Colin? I don't know, Greg, did you want to jump in first? I see you went off mute. No, I think that uh, your experience with, you know, master contracts versus individual agencies would be helpful. Yeah, so actually, Chavik, if you want to go back to that slide that said types of solicitations um, that went through the sprint, um, basically, uh, the, the answer is all the above. I mean, I think there is a unique value in, in picking RFPs that may touch multiple agencies because it's a great way to create a structure to allow for that cross collaboration and to get input from these different stakeholders. But we've also had sprints that have been very targeted at a specific complex RFP that's just for one agency. I mean, even the RFP that Arlene was leading, that was specifically for the Department of Transportation. But you'll see the fourth bullet on the screen here, it was a really complex electric vehicle infrastructure RFP that Connecticut did. And that was sort of multiple agencies, but it was largely a couple of big players and divisions. And that sprint was really just about kind of aligning those players versus sort of getting all this cross-agency collaboration. Um, similarly, on the, in the social services world, at the bottom of the screen, that's you know, been a similar uh, experience there where we're trying to potentially get a lot of different program folk together who might have different visions for what they want out of this service and using the sprint to sort of align them, even though it's not a cross-agency. I do want to pull up one thing that Arlene just mentioned um, with regard to sprints and also gets to that question of virtual um, sprint versus in-person sprint. You could do an in-person sprint, you can do a virtual synchronous sprint, or you could do an asynchronous sprint, if you will, with emails. Um, we think that that, um, that synchronous, uh, whether it's in-person or it's once a week uh, with everybody together is the right way to do it. And this speaks to a lot of these questions. Arlene, you mentioned that I think it was uh, Department of Transportation person that they may have said that this is the first time that they felt like part of the process or been heard. And I think that there was a question in either the Q&A or the 
chat about IT and the expertise that's needed for IT contracting and how do you how do you deal with that? Well, you 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 do it through these kind of group meetings of people from very different backgrounds getting together to work collaboratively for a shared goal. And 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 if you can do that for an hour and a half a week, you can get a great product at the end. And to somebody else's question, just vendors will respond to this effort and they will you will get better responses. Well, thank you, Colin. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Arlene and Lynn, for everyone's time today. We really appreciate you. And I really got a lot out of this, as I'm sure everyone else did. As a reminder, at the close of today's webinar, you are going to be uh, redirected a, to a survey. If you would like to receive your contact hour for attending today, you must complete that questionnaire. Also, all registrants uh, to the webinar will receive a copy of the PowerPoint deck uh, within 48 hours coming from us at NASPO. So you're not going to want to miss our next NASPO webinar on October 5th. So make sure that you check out NASPO.org to register for it. Thank you, everyone, once again. And everybody, let's end our week strong. Thanks. <laughs>